Good afternoon, my name is Christian Davies. I'm the Jean Jones Director of Public Programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Today's Art Bite Lecture Series is supported by Nevada Humanities with additional sponsorship and free admission for students supported by the Core Humanities Program at the University of Nevada, Reno. We thank you for their support and we couldn't present programs like these without them. I'd like to start off with a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Please feel free to use the chat feature of the, web, uh, of the webinar and the Q&A feature to queue up any questions that you have during the talk and we'll be sure to get to them after Jeff and Nikki's conversation with Bill Fox. Today's program features the authors of Until Proven Safe, The History and the Future of Quarantine, Jeff Mano and Nicola Twilley in conversation with the Center for Art and Environments, Peter E. Poole Director Bill Fox. Until Proven Safe, The History and Future of Quarantine is out now wherever you buy books, including the museum store and the museum's uh, online shop at shop.nevadaart.org. Jeff Maynow is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, A Burglar's Guide to the City, as well as the architecture and technology blog, Building Blog. He regularly writes for the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, Wired, and many other publications. And his co-author, Nicola Twilley, is the co-host of the award-winning podcast, Gastropod, a personal favorite of my own, which you should definitely check out, which looks at food through the lens of science and history. She is also a frequent contributor to The New Yorker, Mano and Twilly live in Los Angeles, California. And the way you start the book is to make a nice clear delineation between a couple of terms on, a, as we talked about as on a spectrum of activity, um, one of which is isolation and one of which is uh, quarantine. And there's some other things in between about, about isolating people and populations in response to threats. And maybe we could just start there if you want to define those two things and we'll start, start with that. Uh, sure, do you, do you want me to yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's a it's a great question because I think it really sets the the terms for for the entire discussion as well as really kind of sets up what the book is really about. Um, you know, there's a there's a big difference between quarantine and isolation. Um, I think the easiest way maybe to describe it is that isolation occurs when you are separating things or people because you know that they're infected or you know that they're uh, you know they're contaminated or they're dangerous in some way. Um, and so if you actually have uh, say COVID nineteen or you've got Ebola and you're put into a you know, you're, you stay at home or you're put into a different medical ward, you've been isolated. Um, whereas quarantine is interesting because quarantine means that uh, it requires uncertainty. It means that we don't know if you're infected. It means you don't know if you yourself are harboring something within you that has yet to emerge. Um, and so quarantine instantly becomes a metaphor. Um, it instantly becomes something that is much larger than just a medical practice. Um, that becomes something that can, uh, you know, shape literature, uh, that can become a kind of um, guiding idea for entire uh, things from politics to uh, to uh, you know agriculture, as you mentioned, and so what I like about quarantine and why you know I think we we it sustained an entire book is just really that idea that um, you know we, we're going to find the space and time in which to see if something emerges and 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 to see if something is proven safe, uh, and so that's really what the the difference is and why and why why we wrote a book about quarantine. It's kind of a fascinating anomaly in at least Anglo-Saxon legal thought where you're always innocent until proven guilty. With a quarantine, you are dangerous until proven safe, hence the title of our book. Mm. Um, and I think that also makes it, it makes it very powerful. It makes it also, um, as history has shown us, very dangerous because as Jeff says, that uncertainty, um, it's also based on suspicion. And where you have something, you you know, we 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 suspect you might be dangerous, and we're going to wait and find out. Well, where you have suspicion, you have bias, and that's mm -hmm. um, that's definitely true of many quarantines, um, past and present. So, it's a it's a powerful term uh, metaphorically, but also a dangerous um, term um, too. Yeah, well, maybe we'll come back to that notion at the at the end when we talk about discrimination based on quarantine and some other things. I, so quarantine as a term arises 1600s. Is it that late? Uh, it, 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 it's really earlier than that, actually. Yeah, it, we, um, it, you know, it, it, it comes all the way back to the, the late 1300s. And, um, you know, what's also interesting and worth pointing out is that originally the, the notion of quarantine, um, you know, which was formalized in the Adriatic Sea, uh, specifically in Dubrovnik, uh, which was then called the Ragusa and was part of the Venetian Republic. Um, and that's where the first formal quarantine order was, was given. Um, but originally quarantine, um, interestingly, was actually, uh, was, instead of being quarantena, was actually trentena. It was a 30-day period. 
Um, so that's also interesting. Um, you know, it sounds like a very minor difference, but it was expanded from 30 days to 40 days. Uh, this is in the late 1300s again, six, 600 years ago. Um, but not really for medical reasons, because they didn't have a germ theory of disease. They didn't necessarily know why it worked. You know, it wasn't that they were medical experts, um, but they made the period of time longer from 30 to 40, because 40 as a number had resonance with people culturally and biblically. Um, you know, so 40 days, uh, you know, it's a bit like saying a baker's dozen or other numbers that sort of have meaning to, for us today. Um, but so, you know, 40 was uh, the length of time of Christ's, uh, uh, you know, uh, sojourn in the desert. It was the number of uh, days of rain that uh, in the story of Noah's Ark. Um, it's the length of a Hebrew generation, 40 years. Um, and so by making it 40 days of waiting, um, you know, that that gave people a sense of like, OK, this is a this is a this is something I understand. But it's also not just medical. It's kind of a spiritual process as well. Um, it's something that we're going through in order to purify ourselves or to prove that we're that we're safe. Um, and I think that that's something that's quite interesting. But so anyway, that, that's a long winded way of saying that it's actually even older than the 1600s. And, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, can be tied back uh, more than 600 years in, into the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, quarantine, you can quarantine many different kinds of things. And it's more than just even living things. You can quarantine inorganic things. Mm -hmm. um, what's the relationship between quarantine and channeling the, the, the movement of people on borders, for example? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, we sort of, uh, as we looked into quarantine, we realized it had actually played this role in even shaping where borders are today. Um, it's a, you know, because quarantine is this sort of uh, restriction on the movement of people, it ties very tightly into borders and border control and the structures and bureaucracies we've put in place to sort of manage that. So in one of our chapters, we really trace not only, for example, um, you know, several borders in Africa are where they are because of quarantine lines. Um, they literally are kind of fossilized quarantine lines now as international borders. But then the, you know, the document we use to cross borders today, the passport, is in fact a direct descendant of the, the health passport, which was an innovation during the Black Death um, in what is now Italy to allow people to move between cities without quarantining. So this was your piece of paper that would actually kind of allow you to dodge quarantine if you were traveling between say Bologna and Genoa and, and you wanted to say, I'm coming from a safe place, you needn't suspect me. You needn't quarantine me. Um, you know, I don't pose a danger. Um, and the, the, the authorities would issue this, this document, a health passport that is, you know, now something that structures how we move around the globe, citizenship, our access to rights. Um, mm. And so it, it has is this very powerful uh, sort of structuring mechanism for not only where borders are, but how we move around them. One of my favorite stories is uh, the cordon sanitaire or quarantine line at the edge of the Austro-Hungarian Austro empire. Um, it, they maintained for 100 years. So in the 1700s and in, um, in the start of the 1800s, they maintained this quarantine buffer at the edge of it, it was thousands of miles long um, along the edge of the empire. And sort of, you know, the idea was on one side was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. On the other side was the East and, you know, all it uh, represented in, in the European mind. Mm -hmm. And and this this quarantine buffer zone um, is, you know, was this strange place to live. People who lived there had to serve on the quarantine line. Um, you know, you had to rotate in and out. And what's, what was so fascinating for me, there were checkpoints. So it, was, it was a very kind of interesting space. But what was so fascinating to discover is that that border has left its mark on both um, people who live there today and the European imagination in terms of so people still today there have higher levels of mistrust, higher levels of corruption. It's sort of that Balkan region that's very fragmented um, and, and traced back to this idea of kind of a wall sickness or that having this space um, of uncertainty and um, surveillance has really kind of left its mark. But it's also where, um, where we get our uh, vampire myths from. I mean, this is the, <laughs> the home of the vampire myth, which, you know, with the, the vampire as this sort of undead figure is an amazing sort of 
uh, uh, analogous state to the sort of uncertainty of quarantine, neither one thing nor the other, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's an infectious disease. It's spread by direct contact, right? Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah, I think that what's so interesting about quarantine is that, you know, it does take place by definition at borders. So it takes place where two things meet or where two things encounter one another. And so it's about defining inside versus outside. Uh, it's also about taking that outside and putting it in an inside by making it go to a quarantine station or putting it in a lazaretto, which is just another word for that. Um, so it's this really, really interesting kind of like negotiation of where inside ends and where the outside begins, um, even to the point of actually, um, I don't know if we'll discuss this or not, but, you know, even in terms of everything that is off the earth, uh, you know, is a potential threat to microbial life here. And so, uh, you know, we, we uh, and vice versa. So we, we also look at um, quarantine uh, in, in its use of by NASA and other space agencies where, you know, where there's this, the, the definition of a kind of limitless outside, which is, you know, everything, everything off the planet earth. But anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, way of, uh, I think of defining uh, self and other. Yeah, it's a very, you know, the, um... As you know, I worked with NASA for several years on developing you know, protocols for exploration of Mars. And you can't answer the basic question of, is there life on Mars? Unless to some extent you can quarantine us yeah. away from it. So you have to look, and you've been to the safe room, to the safe rooms, right? Where the clean rooms at JPO, I think, where they actually you know, have to construct the instruments we now have driving around the planet and to keep our genome off of those, off of those vehicles. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, we did go and visit uh, Percy or Perseverance is the rover that is uh, now on Mars. Um, it's called in the clean room at JPL and there's a the whole protocol you have to go through down to even what deodorant you're allowed to use, um, mm. what shower gels, because I mean, if you can smell it, it's a molecule and they don't want any of these molecules landing on the instrumentation. I mean, this is... This, when you say clean room, the level of cleanliness is something else altogether and something they're continuously developing. So what's so fascinating to us is that, you know, these clean rooms um, in some ways are the uh, microbial equivalent of sort of the Antarctic or, um, you know, a deep sea thermal vent or the bottom of a mine in terms of the species that live there because they are the most, um, uh, resistant to, you know, they turn out to be sort of heat loving, acid resistant, um, they don't mind how dry it gets, they can, you know, these are the, this space inadvertently selects for extremophiles. Um, and that's the ongoing challenge of planetary protection is how do we clean ourselves, as you, as you say, off of these rovers, but in, in our cleaning processes, we actually inadvertently select for um, the things that are most likely to be able to survive a space journey and make it on Mars. Mm -hmm. And that's why, so NASA's um, uh, chief scientist has gone ahead and said, there is life on Mars. Um, we know because we brought it, it's ours. <laughs> mm. um, what we don't know is if there's indigenous life on Mars. And so they have in the clean rooms, they have something, and I just love this language. They have something called witness plates where they're aiming to take a sort of microbial census. Um, and and those, those microbes, uh, they serve as sort of the testing ground for new cleaning techniques, you know? but they also are a record of basically a passenger list for who we sent to Mars. Um, so that if then Percy does um, find something on Mars, we can maybe say, well, we know we brought that kind of microbe maybe. So, hmm. um, so it's a really interesting, I mean, it's just that, you know, you can imagine the fractal sort of unknowns opening up. We don't know what exactly we're sending. We don't know if it can survive the journey to Mars. We don't know if it would thrive once it gets to Mars. We don't know if there's any life on Mars already. And we don't know if that life would be harmed by our life. So it's just um, navigating that level of uncertainty takes quarantine to a whole new level. You know, it's uh, working at the Nevada Museum of Art, uh, which is in Reno, Nevada. And if you want to go to California, you drive over Interstate 80, uh, the interstate freeway that goes to Sacramento and then on to San Francisco, the Bay Area. And of course, there is an inspection station there. Uh, you're required to at least slow down and make eye contact with the agent who's sitting in the booth. Um, but sometimes you get stopped and they want to know what fruits and vegetables do you have in the car? Yeah. Um, and 
because they're worried that you're, we're coming from a desert environment where it's, um, you know, it's fairly stable in a sense, but you're going into a, a, an agricultural area like the Central Valley of California and an entire, you know, industry could be threatened yeah. by bringing in the wrong kind of fruit with the wrong kind of fly on it. Yeah, the, one of the things that we did uh, for the research, which was uh, a really fascinating experience, actually, was we went to one of those agricultural inspection stations on the border between Arizona and California outside a town called Needles. And um, it was yet another place, actually, where we ended up putting on, you know, the, the protocol of how, how to do these inspections. We had to wear the bee proof suits and go out and, and inspect these trucks because um, we were there during bee season. Um, I think a lot of people, speaking for myself at least, I didn't know that um, in order to pollinate uh, many of the crops here in California, um, in this case it was the almond uh, crop, they actually import billions of bees on trucks that drive through and have to get inspected, and then the bees are then, you know, basically toured around California so that they can pollinate trees, and then they continue on up through Idaho and whatnot, um, in a circuit of pollination that lasts, you know, all, all year long where just bees are being driven around. Um, but in any case, yeah, this idea that they're maintaining, um, it's, it is both isolation and quarantine. You know, they're looking specifically for things that are coming into the state and that, and that might uh, take, uh, take hold here. Um, you know, California is a very verdant place. It's quite easy for things to grow and become invasive. And so, um, you know, one of the things they explained was that you have to think like a, a pest, like think like a germ, think like an invader. Um, you know, where would you be if you were a little insect uh, and you were in a, a moving pod that someone is bringing their goods from, you know, Atlanta to Los Angeles, and they've packed everything into one of those moving boxes. Um, if you've got an RV or you have a grill that's been in your backyard for the last season, and now it's in the, you know, the back of your truck, um, you know, where might, uh, you know, worms or flies uh, lay eggs or where might they have a nest, um, where might ants be living? Um, and so it's quite interesting, this idea of like thinking like a pest or thinking like the threat. Uh, in order to find the vectors or find the places of hiding that might, uh, you know, bring something into a landscape like California. I think that was a, a, one of the more interesting parts of, 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 of learning how uh, quarantine and isolation can actually be successfully implemented. One of the kind of goals of looking at quarantine across so many different kind of fields and mm -hmm. scales and, 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 and ecosystems was to kind of pull out these threads. Um, so thinking like a pest, um, you know, well, you might want to think like a germ too, you know, these are, these are kind of con like, they're just threads that run through the book. And another one that I thought was really interesting that you see a lot with um, at the, say that these border inspection stations is the idea that quarantine is inevitably leaky. Um, you know, as you pointed out, may, most people just make eye contact <laughs> with the, with the um, inspector, you know, they can't stop all the traffic. This is another thing that you see again and again in the history of quarantine is this balancing act between um, wanting the protection of quarantine, but not wanting trade and movement to suffer. You want to have your cake and eat it too. You know, you don't want to import disease, but you also don't want to shut down the border and, and lose all that income and again applies to health um, as as much as it does to plants but so they can't inspect everything and they know that the disease will get in but what quarantine does and this is how the cdc sees it too hmm. is it um flattens the curve it slows things down it buys you time and so bees are actually a perfect perfect example of that we use the quarantine in california for this varroa destructor mite that has been, you know, behind a lot of the colony collapse stuff you hear about, where um, bees are just getting wiped out, mm. um, and of course, eventually that mite made its way into California because quarantine is inevitably leaky. But what it did was, and and so now they don't um, inspect for that. Uh, they, it's not quarantined because it's here. But what it did was it bought some time to first develop kind of treatments. Um, pesticides and hive sprays and so on that can help get rid of the mite. And even for um, researchers to build something they're calling a hygienic bee hmm. that, <laughs> that has the skills to detect this mite and get rid of the mite itself. Um, and so it, quarantine was about buying time. It's leaky, it's imperfect, it's never watertight. And that frustrates people, I think, because they think, what is the point of this thing? Um, the person in front of me could have brought an orange in, into California or, you know, the, the, the person, this person is still doing this dangerous thing and I am staying in quarantine, it, it makes you feel like your own efforts are not worth anything, but that's by design. Quarantine <laughs> always works that way and it still buys you the time you need. 
the so time scales and and porosity. Um, for me, the, the primary example of that is how we try to contain radioactivity. Uh, and we try to isolate things that are radioactive from the human population. Um, and I know you've been to the, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project in New Mexico, which we can talk about. But I just want to say that um, I went through Yucca Mountain on a writing assignment one time and um, had three engineers escorting me around and, and talking to me, which was entertaining. And it was the leakiest place literally I've ever seen. There was just water pouring down the walls. And where does it come from? Well, it comes through the rock from the top of the mountain. They took a water truck up to the top. They opened it up. They emptied out all the water onto the, onto the soil and they drove away. Three days later, that water is, is trickling down through the vaults where they're going to put the casks of radioactive. And this is high level radioactive material. So they realize you start to put these casks together and they get very hot all together and they'll melt almost anything. So I thought, well, let's put a shield over the, the, over the cask and the water will hit that and run off. And then they realized that wouldn't work because the, the barrels would get so hot, it would melt the, anything they put up there, including a titanium roof. So um, I, I, to me, I just, I don't understand. Plutonium's fugitive, you know, it wants to go away. Talk about germs. So it's an inorganic physical reaction. But oddly enough, in some ways, it reminds me very much of what you're talking about, about bees at the border. So maybe describe WIP to us and how, how that works or is projected to. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a fascinating place. And, and I'm, I'm jealous that you got to go into Yucca Mountain. That's a, still a place we'd love to visit. Um, you know, there was a, a, embarrassingly, I can't remember the, the name of the author now, but there's someone who we quote, um, I want to say it's Peter Van Wyk, maybe who wrote a book about a, a, a nuclear waste, but he has a great way of describing the kind of the, the problem of nuclear waste, which is that it's a form of waste that resists its own containment. Um, you know, and that's the problem. You know, it's this thing that, like you say, is fugitive. It wants to move. It wants to go elsewhere. It is like by definition reacting, and, and it's an, it's, a, it's active waste. Um, but so with WIP, um, yeah, I guess the the long story short version of this is that there is a, uh, a east of the city of Carlsbad, New Mexico, um, very nearly on the border with Texas, uh, in a region already known for caves, Carlsbad Caverns, Lechaguilla Cave. You know, it's a very uh, subterranean rich environment. Uh, phosphate mining, et cetera. Um, the Department of Energy is actually building a giant or digging out a gigantic salt mine um, that they're then putting nuclear waste, low level nuclear waste into it. Um, and so it's not things like reactor cores or warheads or that kind of thing. It's like the gloves someone wore when they were working with plutonium or working with other uh, uh, radioisotopes in laboratories around the country that are connected to the defense industry. Um, and so those gloves and those desks and those like pieces of equipment and robes and all this kind of stuff is being shipped to WIP, um, put into similar casks, uh, and then put into the salt. And salt is chosen specifically, um, and it seemed counterintuitive when we first got there, um, because the walls are, are squeezing in, the ceiling is collapsing, you know, everything is held back by chain link fencing and rock bolts, but everything is just squeezing back in. Um, you're 2,150 feet below the surface, so it's, it's a very deep facility. Um, but salt was chosen for that reason. Um, not only does it resist radiation in the first place, but also the idea that it is slowly crushing back in is, ha is the point. Um, you know, it'll entomb the waste uh, and, and effectively kind of absorb it into the geology. So eventually this stuff will just be crushed and sort of become part of the you know, future fossil record of, of human, human civilization. Um, but, you know, actually coming face to face with the radiation was, was interesting. You know, we, uh, not the radiation, excuse me, the, the nuclear waste. Um, because, you know, by the time we actually got to it, and it's a huge facility, so we drove for what felt like, you know, a half an hour on an electric golf cart, uh, you know, through these huge tunnels, you know, that are roaring with ventilation and everything reeks of diesel fuel. Um, you know, our, our lips were salty with all the salt kind of brine that's in the air. Um, but then when you get to the nuclear waste, it would look like someone was loading up a cargo plane, you know, to fly across the Atlantic. There's stuff wrapped in saran wrap. Um, you know, they're just these barrels that look like, uh, you know, you, you might, you would have seen them out on a, on a, on a dock. Um, and that's the logistics of burial for this kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, there, there were just, there's so much uh, uh, that's of interest to talk there, including just the, um, and maybe I can let maybe, Nikki, if you want to talk, describe it, but the, even just the challenge of communicating risk to future generations. I mean, there's just so, there's so many things that are built up in the, in the, in the, in the challenge of, of nuclear waste. Yeah, I mean, I think the the time scale is one thing to talk about, um, Bill, and, and something that I think you would probably have interesting 
uh, things to say about, you know, the idea of designing something for 10,000 years and then communicating about that thing um, in a way that is comprehensible at the end of 10,000 years. But also, I think one of the things that um, is so interesting to us about WIP is this idea of um, risk and consequence. Um, so this you know, the, the, the nuclear waste itself, I mean, it, particularly the, the stuff of WIP, in, in many ways, it's unlikely to, um, to, you know, cause a problem. It's in barrels. It's, you know, uh, uh, for most of the nation's nuclear waste, actually, it's stored above ground in containers right now and isn't put anywhere. And that's just what we live with. But for some reason, when you, um, or not for some reason, but once you start to try and say, well, what should a facility to contain this, where the, the consequence, the risk is the risk is in some ways low, but the consequence is quite extreme. What should that facility look like? And then you end up with this incredible, you know, um, gigantic uh, carved corridors in crystalline salt under the earth and like this whole sequence of protocols um, and vast expense um, because the consequence is unacceptable. So it's a really, again, quarantine is always ends up in these kind of a calculus of risk, benefit, consequence, how to think about um, it. And, and, it, and this, these sort of structures that result from that are fascinating. The example you give in the book um, that's poignant for, for us living in Nevada is that of Las Vegas of if you have trans waste being transported to Yucca Mountain, it's high mm -hmm. level waste, what happens if there is a horrific accident with a truck or a train uh, in a city of, you know, two million people? Yeah. yeah, it was amazing, actually. There was a white paper that we found that had been written, um, uh, I want to say about two decades ago, but it explored that, that, that prospect, you know, looked at the, the transportation logistics that have to get the waste to these facilities. Um, you know, it just uh, as a footnote to that, even, uh, you know, the Department of Energy underwrites highway upgrades for some of the roads that lead to WIP. Uh, to make sure that drivers can in fact get this waste there safely and don't need to take you know overly narrow roads or or particularly uh tight curves and so some of the roads in new mexico that maybe you've even driven on if you've been to new mexico um, are actually part of our nation's nuclear waste entombment infrastructure um, you know so it's kind of high, all of the stuff is hiding in plain sight um, in any case the idea was to look at what happens if we're bringing high level nuclear waste through las vegas um, incredibly, that's that's the route that has to be taken at the moment if 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 Yucca Mountain were to be open. Um, so you've got very, very dangerous waste coming through the city. And the modeling process was to say, okay, there's a particular truck accident or a train derailment. And um, you know, it was a the, the consequences were incredible, actually. So the first of all, the the model gave the owners of re nearby hotels and convention centers, um, I think it, I want to say it was 91.3 seconds. Uh, before the radioisotopes reach their buildings in downtown Las Vegas, um, where they will be sucked into air conditioning vents and outdoor uh, ventilation systems. That'll be pulled into the hotel interiors and the casinos and the convention centers, um, where it'll just get cycled around and get stuck in filters. It'll get stuck in the casino carpet. It'll get stuck in bedspreads and, you know, all, everything that's inside these buildings, you know, further irradiating them and, 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 and being almost impossible to get out. Um, but so they, they look at how, you know, if you wanted to try to decontaminate Las Vegas, um, they go through a series of different uh, types of, 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 of method. And uh, one of them would take, I think it was 25,000 machine years uh, to actually decontaminate the city. Uh, and then they, uh, they end up coming to the conclusion that basically Las Vegas might have to be dismantled and, 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 and abandoned. And, and, abandoned. Mm -hmm. and they refer to permanent quarantine. Um, you know, so the point, again, is not necessarily that the risk of that derailment is necessarily high, but the consequences of it would be enormous for millions of people, for an entire region of Southern Nevada, uh, you know, even for the national economy. And so that kind of thing, you know, also came up uh, just briefly too, when we met, um, and this is one of the reasons why WIP was so interesting to us, I think, even though it's an isolation facility, not a quarantine facility, um, is just simply that it showed how human beings try to contain a threat on that, that scale, both spatially and temporally. But it was interesting actually, because when we were in London, um, we met the head of the of London's Ebola response, and he took us through the Ebola uh, emergency ward at the Royal Free Hospital. And um, not only were there a lot of similarities in terms of architectural flow, uh, in terms of air handling, um, you know, we saw a lot of similar things. Even the even the burial of a of an Ebola contaminated human corpse, uh, you know, there are special metallurgical processes for welding them shut. 
You have to um, bring a welder into the high level isolation unit to weld a zinc casket shut. Yeah. Um, yeah, with like the, with like fascinating analogies to some of the ways that we bury nuclear waste. Um, but you know, he was he was explaining how again the risk of Ebola, uh, you know, spreading throughout London um, is 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 negligible. You know, there's no it, it's 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 because of the way the disease is transmitted, because of the infrastructure there. It's it's a very low risk event. But the consequences of an Ebola outbreak in London would be huge. And so you know that's that's where the the expense, the design energy. Um, you know, all the things that go into trying to contain or isolate or quarantine these threats really comes from. And so that's a, that's another theme that just kind of, you know, uh, like a thread Nikki mentioned that sort of weaves throughout a lot of the things that we we write about in the book. Yeah, you, you write about that fascinating intersection of, of artists being involved with uh, warning systems at WIP. Um, how do you, I mean, I, there is no human language that survived for 10,000 years, for example. And, and you're talking about having to isolate, I mean, even if a half-life of something let's say plutonium is 10,000 years, it will still kill you. You're talking about containment for a million years in some cases. Yeah. So how do you design a warning system that does not in fact attract people to a site and say, oh, this is interesting, dig it up, you know? Totally. Sure. Well, and, and, and in fact, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't, but the, the, <laughs> the yeah. process- well, you can try. <laughs> but the ideas that people come up with in the process are fascinating. I think one of my favorites is the, genetically modified cat. Um, so there was a, a, a suggestion. I mean, and these are all like not, these are legitimate suggestions, you know, that were considered by the Department of Energy and made by, you know, team, they got together teams of um, linguistics experts and anthropologists and artists, as you say, and philosophers and, and you know, anyone who could have some insight in how, to, how do we tackle this problem of communicating um, so far into the future that if you go that far back, you know, it's, it's, it's before <laughs> we had recognizably modern humans. So, um, so how could we possibly imagine in 10,000 years that we're, I mean, what are we going to be communicating with anyway? But, um, but the cats were uh, going to be genetically modified so that they glowed um, in the presence of radiation. And so in the future, 10,000 years in the future, these cats would um, you know, uh, if you got too close to the radiation would start glowing and presumably people would immediately know that they should retreat to a place where their cat no longer glowed. <laughs> the, uh, my other favorite one is a conference we went to where people were just a Department of Energy conference um, where people were discussing this problem and one participant, it, and it wasn't April Fool's Day, um, said, well, why don't we just, his his proposal was a legacy website accessible by a smartphone um, that would contain all the information and you just I mean yeah and and, and, and will still be accessible you know 7,000 years from now in the middle of the desert so given how given how how quickly um, you know code software hardware all that stuff changes even trying to archive projects at the museum right it's like there's no going to be no legacy system that's going to last no, you know, a hundred years even. So. It, it, was, it was really, really interesting though, because, you know, the Department of Energy put out, I mean, hundreds of thousands of pages to try to get this approved by the Environmental Protection Agency, which, which they did. Um, but so if you actually go through the documents, you know, some of them, like the ones that are about the future warning signs, um, you know, read like almost like a graduate paper in art history, because it's specifically referring to, to things like the, the pyramids, the Code of Hammurabi, like all of these things that exist in art history in terms of a message that has been inscribed in the material um, that has survived for archaeologists or art historians or linguists to analyze. Um, but what was amazing about one of the papers in particular is that what they did settle on um, are giant uh, blocks of, of stone, granite, that will be, and they, they even refer to it as, a, I think they say pure, or not pure, that there's, a, there's a, just a, there's a, they're, they're very proud of the granite that they've chosen. Well, they, they and, deliberately point out it's better than the rock at Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Which I think is just amazing. The idea that the U.S. Department of Energy is actually bragging about building something better than Stonehenge, uh, I, I just think is a, you know, one of the one of those things that deserves further further comment. But yeah. You know, the, the you know your book is is laden with ironies of that kind, and uh, and as you say, I mean, quarantine is such a rich metaphorical engine uh, that it just it spins off all of these you know ludicrous ideas, things that are comical if they weren't dealing with something like plutonium, but. You know, there's also, um, so you, you talked to a person at WHO, uh, the World Health Organization at one point, uh, and in, towards the end of the book, you're, you're talking about what's the future of quarantine going to be? 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and she's actually saying, gosh, you know, quarantine is not, and this is pre-COVID uh, or just pre-COVID, but she's talking about quarantine is not a strategy we favor actually when faced with certain kinds of threats because it does, uh, t- it can identify populations and uh, they become suspicious. And you've talked about the history of that. And, you know, quarantine then becomes this, you know, burden that you have to carry with you. Um, on the other hand, now that we're in COVID, it's clear that quarantine works. Um, it's very effective. All the methods uh, that we have, you know, we've deployed the relatively low tech common sense methods. I say common sense and scare quotes, I guess. But, um, you know, you talk about the necessity to, if we're going to continue to quarantine, to reinvent and reimagine what quarantine is. And maybe we should talk about that just a little bit. And you also talk about, um, in, in kind of the algorithmic sense, it's like, yeah, your house is getting more aware, uh, you know, and Amazon and Google, you know, they're proposing to be able to listen to you in your house as you're speaking. And it can listen for signs of discomfort, for example, and say like, hi, do you need a cough drop? You know, shall I, Amazon, should we send you a cough drop to buy? Those kinds of things. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. Big topic, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, not at all. Uh, John, I, I can talk about smart homes and stuff. And then if you want to talk about like re- redesigning or, or yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, start. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big nest of, 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 uh, of issues that I think we're now in fully in the thick of, you know, as quarantine um, is in effect being redesigned, uh, you know, with or without our input um, by corporations that have realized, especially over the, in the economy of the last uh, 18 months that you know, the, the stay at home, the work from home economy of, of uh, being able to order things, have things delivered, uh, you relying on smart uh, appliances, the devices that listen, et cetera, um, you know, really is kind of the, the economic shape of the future. Um, but so we talk in the book about how, for example, what you just mentioned, Bill, how, you know, Amazon did in fact patent a way for its Alexa smart speaker system to identify so- sounds th- uh, that resemble illness. So it might know that you've got a cough or it might know that you're you know, affected by some kind of a, a germ that's going around. Um, Google at one point was doing the Google uh, flu trends uh, uh, program, which was looking at um, if suddenly a bunch of people in St. Louis were Googling what you know, symptoms of the flu or Googling for cough drops or Googling for some kind of a remedy or, or pharmacy hours. Um, the inference that was meant to take that, that Google took from that was that there must be a flu hotspot. Um, but now, of course, we have actual like smart thermometers. So if you know you take your child's thermo- the temperature or even your own, the thermometer itself reports the temperature to the company that makes the thermometer. And so there'll be a literal hotspot somewhere in Charlotte, North Carolina, or in Kansas or Reno, um, you know, that indicates that this is where a disease is, is, is emerging. And so what we do in the book is we look at this kind of convergence of, of big data um, modeling uh, and the smart appliances that are coming into our houses, including in the form for the time being uh, in elder care. So in, in um, assisted living facilities are becoming more and more automated and more and more filled with this kind of technology. So Doppler radar, if you've fallen over, it'll register that your body is, 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 you know, has collapsed. Um, sensors in the floor to pick up collapses as well. Um, you know, uh, even color monitors in, in one way mirrors that can pick up if you're having a heart trouble or maybe you've had a stroke. But so that kind of technology inevitably is going to become, is going to trickle down and just enter into our homes. You know, your people are going to want Doppler radar in case their baby falls out of a crib or in case, you know, whatever it might be. And so as that technology really kind of makes our homes into medical diagnostic tools, and as that collides with big data companies that are trying to find new markets for their, their supercomputing powers, you know, we outline what I think is a pretty dystopian vision of the ability of your house to quarantine you, you know, so, and, and, and not allow you to go out and let's say you have proof of vaccination or you have proof that you're going to the doctor or you're going to a testing facility, um, and, you know, and that kind of thing, you know, you already see in, in indications of it even in Australia uh, where, you know, there was an in, in, interesting and ominous article by a family that had gone into hotel quarantine there, but they were escorted to a hotel without being told where the hotel was um, by military official or, you know, soldiers. Uh, they were give, brought to a hotel room and then not given a key, uh, so they couldn't actually use the electronic door lock to get a, to get out or, or or even open the window. And so my point is simply that you know it, it's it'll be um, something I think almost certainly will be in the everyday domestic landscape uh, in the years to come. You know where quarantine just sort of becomes a different mode for your house. You just kind of switch things on. 
uh, and you go back into work from home mode or quarantine mode or, or lockdown. And I think that that's something that, you know, is, is, is uh, ominous, but, but likely. One of the things that's really interesting is, um, and uh, the World Health Organization official that we spoke to, Bill, that you mentioned, um, she sort of said, look, quarantine's a blunt tool. Um, and, you know, that is undoubtedly true. And the big push um, to redesign quarantine is all coming on this technology side. Um, can we make it more precise? Can we make it less uh, less clunky? You know, we don't have to just lock up entire populations. We can have this very precision quarantine, even anticipatory quarantine. Um, and and that's you know this is this is where the big tech companies and even sort of companies that you hear about in defense spaces like Palantir and so on are are getting involved because they see an opportunity to leverage what they do, which is data management tracking. And, and, and to apply it to quarantine so that, that, you know, quarantine moves from, you know, this kind of very old school, you're in a place for an amount of time to a much more ubiquitous sort of um, net of surveillance um, that is shaping your movement um, in, a, in much more precise fashions. What we end up saying in the book is that um, these precision quarantines are actually, um, at least thus far, less effective um, people they, what they don't take into account is that people um, get very frustrated by unequal treatment mm -hmm. and being by not being able to understand rationales and so the actual I mean you even see it with are we in the purple tier or the red tier and can I have six friends um, or only two households together and all of these the 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 um, minutia of the rules to try and make quarantine more precise actually makes them seem less um, important to the people who are going to have to follow them. And if you're not following them, then they're not doing much good. Um, it, there's also a sort of limited predictive ca capability in the book. We get into the sort of limitations of modeling as it stands right now. And where what we say is, yeah, quarantine needs to be redesigned, but this technological focus is much less, while we, it's important to talk about because it's happening, is actually not the kind of redesign that needs to happen. The kind of redesign that needs to happen is about quarantine as a lived experience. Um, even in public health circles where people think about quarantine and measure whether it's effective or not, and they very rarely think of it as, as in terms of both the logistics and the experience, the emotional impact uh, of quarantine. So, which is why you have these situations where, you know, families are being asked to quarantine in multi-generation homes um, where they can't safely isolate. And during lockdowns in America, most of the transmission was happening in homes. Um, and so that's a, that's a logistics question. We also get into the question of how do you make quarantine feel meaningful, me feel um, rewarding as an individual? You are doing something great. You're restricting your own movement for the public good. And yet it feels, and it has always felt throughout history. And there are amazing letters from during the Black Death about how people, how they're so bored in quarantine, <laughs> you know, and they didn't even have sourdough starches and banana bread to, to get them through it. So, um, let alone Netflix. So uh, we even speak in the book with a boredom researcher and explore these questions of like, how can we, if we're going to be quarantining more, which is, you know, what we believe, what most public health officials believe is that we're entering this new era of quarantine. Let's actually do the work to redesign it logistically and experientially so that it works for people so that people aren't worried about, you know, having to break quarantine to feed their families, um, that, that they are able to quarantine in a space and that they are, um, that we don't have this sort of outbreak of boredom, loneliness, and frustration. We know how to design great experiences. Let's apply that expertise to quarantine. Yeah, that's great. So we're at about 10 minutes till, um, and because we've had, a, as Christian put it, a kind of an intimate audience today, um, so I thought that we should just go with that. But Christian, I imagine there might be a question or two, and I, you may have some as well. So why don't we just uh, go ahead and open up for the remainder of the hour? Yeah, if anybody in um, our audience has any questions, please use the Q&A or the chat feature to queue those up and we'll get those in. Um, Jeff and Nikki, one, one thing that I really enjoyed in the book was the, the section about 
and I have to admit, I listened to it, I didn't read it, so it may have been a full chapter, but it, the, the audiobook doesn't tell you that, um, yeah. is the quarantining of mail <clears throat> and the subculture that surrounds quarantined mail and the collection now of quarantine mail, which I think is actually kind of risky thinking about how some of these things stick around. And it reminded me of how my, my email application for work actually quarantines emails. And it seems like a true reform of quarantine. And I wondered if you could talk about, as we think about the future of quarantine, what, what, what that might look like in a digital sense as we, we don't send these letters that need to be quarantined but was there anything that sort of emerged in your research around this new world of isolation and quarantine and how digital goods um, are, are impacted by these sort of changes? Oh, that's a really interesting question. And for years, you know, I had a Google alert on quarantine because we were researching this book. And pre-COVID, let me tell you, everything was Norton antivirus this. And, you know, it was entirely about these kinds of digital software quarantines. Um, and I do think there's a lot um, there in terms of not just um, sort of the, the cybersecurity aspects, but even how we think about information spread um, in this era and, and what, what role quarantine could spread, play in that kind of transmission. If you think that, you know, um, un, uh, like uh, untrue um, fake news <laughs> spreading <laughs> is a virus, um, and you apply quarantine logic to it, what does that look like? And does that help? Is there a way to take this tool that is quite effective despite all its uh, limitations that you know we talk about in the book, but is effective? Can you apply that logic to this sort of greater um, uh, digital information ecosystem that we're living in that arguably is making people sick? Um, <laughs> And so that, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. It's not something we dive into in the book, but I think we do talk about the, the issues around information and trust that have made, you know, one of the things we say in the book is you can't have public health without a public. And I think a lot of the fragmentation of the American public is to do with living in different information bubbles. So it's definitely, um, it, and, and the other thing we look at in the book is, is quarantine as a logic and thus as a logic you can apply to these different problems so i think it's a really interesting question but like you said nobody likes feeling singled out um and isolated and i think that is something that we're facing in this very moment as these um tech corporations actually quarantine and, and review uh be it a tweet or an image or whatever information that we're sharing um we're seeing the the principles of quarantine applied to um to thought viruses or thought patterns or thought i don't know if thought virus is fair i think somebody would say it's not a virus it's true um even if it's not true <laughs> um, but and again anybody in our audience who has a question um you can raise a hand or even comment and we can even turn it on since we have a more intimate group today um, oh, just but, one, um I, the, the, I just wanted to mention it because i think it's such an interesting uh, it, it came up uh, w when Nikki was describing some of the uh, agricultural quarantine stuff, um, you know, one of the other metaphors that I just thought was really interesting, um, you know, she already mentioned the witness plates, which are the things that are inside the spacecraft assembly facilities that capture stray microbes and chemicals. Um, but also there are sentinel plots, uh, which is just another amazing metaphor and feels like, you know, a future project for the Center for Art and Environment. Um, but a sentinel plot is a, is a piece of land where they're waiting to see if one of these, uh, and anything from stray seeds to uh, 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 plant pathogens show up. Um, and there's even sentinel chickens, uh, so that there, there are actually small groups of chickens that are maintained, like in the city of Los Angeles, so that if a chicken, uh, if an avian flu or other types of bird viruses come through, um, it'll infect the chickens. West and, Nile. Oh yeah, West more. Nile, yeah. It, it, it'll, it'll infect those chickens, which are sentinel chickens. And then they'll, then they'll know to actually look out for this thing. Um, but I, do, I love this idea that there are places like parts of the earth where there are sp specific animals um, that act as sentinels for something that's on its way. And that's like sort of the, another aspect of, of the quarantine um, you know, process or of quarantine logic that I think is so sort of metaphorically rich. Well, and the, and the idea of, whereas we talked about sort of 
smart homes and their sensing capacity, but you know, a, a herd of chickens is also a sort of sensor is a sensor for the city of Los Angeles about true, the spread yeah. of disease. Yeah. So um, it's a they, they, these low tech methods work too. I mean, one thing that Los Angeles also does that I had no idea um, the, the U.S. government. Um, funded the construction of the world's largest fruit fly rearing facility um, in, in Guatemala. They raise uh, fruit uh, flies and then they, st they uh, sterilize them using radiation. And, uh, and then the city of LA actually dumps these um, fruit flies out over Los Angeles to, um, and, and you know, other Californian municipalities do it too. Um, and the idea is that they will, these sterile males will breed with um, any, you know, fruit flies that are around and keep, keep the numbers down, but it, it, and because fruit flies would be so devastating to California's fruit industry. Um, but it, it's just a, a, another thing where, again, around LA are dotted these kind of fruit fly traps to <laughs> see. <laughs> and they mark the sterile males with iridescent uh, with fluorescent paint. So if only those are showing up, it's okay. And if, if males are showing up that are not fluorescent, then you know it's a sign of um, that the the fruit fly situation is out of control. But it it was amazing to me that this very low tech infrastructure of sensing is all around us and invisible to us, but keeping um, landscapes, industries, um, and humans safe. I think uh, it's a it's an amazing thing to think about as we kind of wrap up today that you know these these sentinel sort of mechanisms that are in place to help us prevent the need for quarantine in the future, and the idea of you know proactive uh, quarantine almost as a as a means of protecting us from viruses that that may they, to allow us that sense of freedom. And I think one thing that 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 reminded me of, and it's maybe not a hundred percent consensual, is different um, different states and different municipalities that that willingly treat themselves as sentinels and let them let viruses run wild as a means of actually informing other municipalities in different states in and how they may protect their their populace. Don't know that we necessarily want to always have that happen, and I'm not going to call out any states in the lower south. Uh, east of our country that, that might be acting as a sentinel. Um, but it is interesting to think of those those individual actions that in some ways do protect us as we move forward uh, so that we don't have to face quarantines or isolation um, more, more accurately in the future. Well, um, it, it comes back to because quarantine is about uncertainty, anything you can do to reduce that uncertainty um, helps you avoid quarantine. And, and that's, you know, that can be seeing what happens in Florida, or that can be collecting fruit flies. You know, reducing uncertainty is one of the ways to not have to use quarantine, to avoid quarantine. Yeah. Um, I want to thank um, Jeff and Nikki. I want to thank you both so much for being here today. It was a real um, treat to get to read the book, and I, I tore right through it, and being able to revisit was a, was really fantastic. For anybody in our audience who hasn't read it, Again, it's available everywhere you can find books. Um, we recommend small independent bookstores or the museum bookstore itself. I want to thank Bill Fox for joining us and uh, hosting just a really fantastic conversation. Um, this conversation was recorded and will be available on our YouTube site. Um, and uh, definitely thanks to our audience for um, showing up and sticking it out. We're not sure what happened. Uh, I have a feeling our acknowledgement email may have gone, may have been quarantined. Um, itself is some some feedback I got there. So um, thankfully, this is this is available. Again, I'd like to thank Nevada Humanities and the Core Humanities Program at UNR for making this program possible. Uh, Jeff and Nikki, thank you so much. It's been a real treat. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Thank thanks, Bill. Thanks, yeah, it was Bill. a lot of fun this to talk. Really Pleasure, guys. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Good. Take care. Bye. Bye.